So my name is Adam Pittman with Esri, and for the second part of the morning, uh, it's the fun part Damien alluded to. Uh, it's all stories from our customers. So projects, initiatives, things that our customers are doing in the industry, not only in upstream, but also in midstream. Those folks are going to be on stage showing you what they are uh, working on and then answering any questions that you have uh, in the hallways throughout the rest of the week. Our first guest this morning is a customer that has done some pretty interesting work in the operations space and in the HSE space. So I'd like to invite Lee Pena of Marathon Oil, and later Joe Sologub is going to come up. But Lee, come on out. And if you wouldn't mind, Lee, uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about Marathon and then sure. get into your project. Um, so my name is Lee Pena. I'm the Production Engineering Technician Supervisor for the Eagleford Asset. And we currently have about 1,500 operating wells just within our Eagleford Basin. Um, that being said, we cover huge amounts of miles. And what I'd like to talk to you guys about today is how we use GPS, which I know many of you guys have currently, uh, global positioning systems and all our vehicles, how we use that data to extract extreme value and helped us kind of work and plan our way for the future, especially in this volatile uh, oil price environment. So one of the things we did, we knew we had GPS data. We have uh, all these vehicles and all that GPS data was just sitting there and nobody was looking at it. So one of the things we proposed is, let's just take a look at this GPS data and see what kind of value we can extract from it. So our data set is going to be Live View GPS. Uh, the integration is going to be the several different platforms that we use to get to our conclusions. Collaborative effort is working with the other teams in the group, being able to disseminate this in a usable format to our end users. And then the analysis, how do we get this data, and what decisions do we make once we have this data. So I'm going to walk you through um, how we accomplish this. Um, this is to kind of set this up. Um, we've got 456 well pads. That encompasses 960 active wells. But we currently, that was about a year and a half ago, we're currently at 1,500 wells now. And I pulled together two ArcGIS guys, uh, two data analysts, and a, stati a statistician. And so that team was tasked with going out there and pulling this data together and to try to understand it. One of the mottos we have for our field at the, about a year and a half ago was we had to visit every well every day the most efficient and effective way. So if you talk about 1,500 wells spread out through a huge distance, you can understand the total amount of operators we needed plus the total amount of vehicles and mileage that we were driving every day. Perception versus reality. When we first started the project, I pulled together some superintendents um, and some supervisors from the field, and I asked them, I said, you know, every well every day, what is our actual number? I mean, what are we actually doing on a daily basis? And if I had four of them in the room together, one guy would start with 95%, the second guy would say 100, the third guy would say 110%, and the last guy would say 120%. So competing objectives. But when we went to mine the data, the real number was 62%. And that was giving them the benefit of the doubt. We took every single vehicle that we had. It didn't matter if it was a completions or a drilling vehicle. If it crossed into a well pad site, we gave them credit for it. We wanted to have the best possible scenario. If we were to filter those out, that number would be closer to 50%. And that was the reality of the situation. And you can't affect change if you're not dealing with the reality of the situation. So how did we get there? Uh, many of you guys have Live View GPS. We wrote a script to extract those points. And then we pushed those into ArcGIS. This was a manual process at first. You're talking about 10-second data for all these vehicles. You're talking about millions of data points every single day. And to do a proof of concept, we, we were doing this by hand. And that's one of the great things about Esri is we reached out to them and said, look, this process takes us four to five hours just for GPS data extraction. Can we do better? And we worked together, and we've created a plugin that now pulls that data automatically into ArcGIS. And then we do our calculations. So we have saved that four hours every day. And this is much more manageable. 
ArcGIS does the heavy lifting. Then we extract that into a visual analytics program that we disseminate to the field. Because as most of you guys know, your production operators, your production supervisors, if you show them this information, you show them a map, that's great. They don't have time to look through the entire map to find out the deficiencies. We had to figure out a way to tell that whole story, get it to them on a daily basis, and it had to be quick. They didn't have time for loading. So we'll show you later some of the ways we solved that. Some of the interesting thing is ArcGIS has tools that we just didn't utilize a lot. There is a, a route optimizer. There's a network analyst tool. And we use those tools to help us understand our routes. We have operators that go to all these wells. Any direction you want to go, doesn't matter. What is the most optimal route to get to all these wells? And what is the minimum amount of miles you have to drive to get to all these wells for every day? Once we had that information, we stuck it in ArcGIS. And what you see here is, is we did a spatial join with the land layers. So one of the great things about this project is our land department was already building GIS layers for our well pads. So those rectangles that you see there are the actual size of our well pads. So what we did is we brought that layer in and we created geofences. Those are now all geofences to the exact size and diameter of our well pads. Then we spatially joined the GPS points on top of it. And any time a GPS point intersected that polygon, we created a calculation that said simply yes. And that's what you see in green. Anything in red has not been visited for that day. And anything in blue is this cooling effect. How long has it, has it been in a 24-hour period before someone actually visited that well? So ArcGIS did, did this heavy lifting for us which allowed us to get to the end product. So one of the things we had to do is get this out to the field. And once we showed them this, so that map is now shown in this graph here. Everything about that map is all plotted in a route that is really user-friendly, user and it's important to the supervisor. So he knows Pleasanton Route 2 for the entire month of February had a 65% completion rating. And once we showed that to them, it really opened their eyes into what is possible, what is feasible, what is timely, and what is manageable. And if you notice on the graph, not a single one of these graphs says 120%. So I didn't expect to find that, but we, we knew there was no 120% out there. But it also lets us group it into areas so we could tell what area was performing, what area was underperforming. Do we need to have more operators in one area? Do we need to work on efficiencies and routing? Do we need to split these routes up? That was all part of the data set that we extracted. One of the things that we wanted to do is QC this data. So what you see is a graph of all the miles driven per vehicle stacked on top of each other. When we used the route optimizer, the minimum amount of miles to get to every single well was 2,400 miles. You had to drive a minimal of 2,400 miles in a day. When we saw this graph, it was really clear there's like a really good pattern here that emerged. And you could see some days we didn't even drive enough miles. So that kind of confirmed what we were seeing. But if, as we were looking at this, we were counting, we we're like one, two, three, four, five, and then like six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And, uh, I was like, what is, what is that? What is, what is going on there? And in the oil field, you work seven days a week. One day is the same as the next. And I still haven't gone back to look, but those look to me like the weekends. That's Saturday and Sunday. And I'm like, that is not supposed to be happening. So once again, using that data to kind of confirm what we had been seeing. Um, and just real quickly, one of the other things we extracted from this graph, um, because we, did, we were able to split these out, we spend more miles driving from the person's home to the office than we do from the office to the wells. We were spending way more mileage paying for people's um, home to office visits. The other thing we extracted was 20% of the vehicles that were out there of the 113, drive to the office, park for eight hours, and then drive back home. 
There was no actual well visits. So that kind of helped us understand, well, who really should be having a vehicle? If we could shave 20% off our operating costs just from that graph alone, that's extremely tangible. So as part of the deliverable, we were um, creating a, a dashboard. And this graph goes out to the operators on a daily basis. We, the first time we sent this out, and it was hovering around 60 62%, the very next day when we ran this again, it's immediately jumped to 85% overnight. And we have not been below 80% since this report has come out. Tangible, but it also showed you're probably never going to get to 100%. So let's talk about that every well every day. Let, let's have that discussion. Um, so as we were able to use this information to help pivot, um, we go out and we spend, on average, we did a, a real quick run, two and a half minutes on pad. And then you go dark for 24 hours until the operator shows up again. And then you get another two and a half minutes. That's what the data was showing. What is so mission critical that we're spending all this time and money for two and a half minutes? What are we possibly doing? And if that data is so important, where is it at? Because I'd love to analyze it. So one of the great things was, let's have that discussion with the, with the supervisors. Can I drop a camera and a microphone on location, get 99% more surveillance, and mitigate my risk? and extend that visit from one day to three days to seven days. Now imagine our operator cost at 1,500 wells. Would this allow us to get to 3,000 wells with the exact same amount of operators that we currently have? Not only that, it's actually going to allow us to scale down from our current size. So if you want to talk about something that's tangible, that's creating that value, this is how we get to 3,000 wells in this price environment. And because we had this automation um, data that was coming in now to ArcGIS, it allowed other departments to take that data and run with it. And so as a, some offshoots from this project, Joe's going to talk about how he took this data and did something really cool with it as well. Joe? Thank you, Lee. So one of the things that uh, we wanted to do was from the HES side, as Lee said, the data was sitting there and we didn't want to look at it just to see who was speeding. We wanted to actually utilize that data to uh, help us on the uh, emergency response side of the business. And so we worked with Esri using their incident management tool and we've configured that uh, into our, our systems uh, with a lot of help from our GIS folks because I am not a GIS person, uh, didn't even know how to spell GIS when we started this. But uh, <clears throat> we worked and we've developed a, a tool uh, utilizing a lot of our own internal programs, policies, procedures, as well as outside consultants and whatnot. And this is kind of the front page of it, as you will. Um, and up at the top are links to our outside software for our incident action planning, uh, links to our internal developed response plans, and then one of our weather providers. And then down at the bottom on this incident management tool, we can now take and put a buffer around a zone. We've got it set from 0 to 50 miles in this particular screen. It's a five-mile shot. Um, and then we can add all kinds of different layers. One of the things is we want in emergency response is to get out of that running around like, like chickens with our head cut off and get into a project mode. And as we all know, we've got all kinds of plans and policies and procedures and if you have to go out and try to find that information in a, in a timely fashion, that can get very burdensome and very frustrating for the responders. So we're trying to develop a tool that puts a lot of that information in their hands fairly quickly. So what we've done is integrated our tactical response plans that we had gone out and developed for our central facilities. Uh, we operate on a centralized basis. And we've developed tactical response plans that are canned, ready to give to somebody if we do have an incident. And that's what you're seeing here in that box. It's kind of blurred out because our legal folks wanted to blur it out. But anyway, um, you can see we've got some, uh, some attachments. Now, one of the things our team struggled with was printing maps in a timely fashion. And this tool has now greatly helped us with that. And, and as somebody said earlier, Damien, I think, you know, sometimes it's simple stuff. We don't need the complex GIS stuff. We just need a simple map. 
and we need it in, a, in an aerial photo, or we need it in a topographical map. This tool allows us to do that one click. We got the same map three different ways. Uh, also, we've got our plans built in there and these attachments, so we can pull up these tactical plans that we've built. Uh, if we were to have an incident, and this is not a real incident, this is just a plan for a real incident, uh, where we would station equipment, personnel, um, uh, recovery type materials. Um, and these are just the screens of those, some of those plans that you see blurred out in the uh, other screen there. But we've gone and, and uh, identified the different types of equipment and whatnot so that our people can uh, respond in a timely, efficient manner and focus on the response, not focus on learning and responding at the same time. So it's been a great help with the help of Esri and, and our ArcGIS folks here in Houston to get that. And it's in the very initial stages. Uh, I'd say this is version 2.5 because TJ and I have been working on this and tweaking it and adding things and we will continue to do so. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lee and Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a couple interesting things there. I, I love that story and uh, the one thing, a couple things kind of jogged my memory along the way there. Uh, I remember Vanessa and I went and met with Marathon gosh, maybe in October last year, and we got, we got sent Joe's way. So we, uh, they're in San Antonio, Vanessa and I are in San Antonio. So we drive down to the marathon offices for the Eagle Ford Asset team, and uh, we meet Joe. And Joe said, okay, who's Esri? Tell me about Esri. And so we gave him the story, told him who Esri was, and that marathon had a bunch of Esri stuff, and we could do these neat projects to, to get things going. So uh, that's pretty interesting. The concluding thoughts... I love what Lee brought up about perception not always being the reality, that Marathon thought something, thought one thing, but actually realized another. And that realization came with the help of, of GIS and spatial analytics. I have my second bullet point being the mushroom cloud. Uh, of course, that's my own term, probably not the best, but what I mean by that is that we came in to solve a problem. You know, live view GPS was there. And that was the initial problem we were there to solve. And it quickly ballooned out and covered not only the, the, the work that we were doing with LiveView GPS, but also it expanded out across to other teams. Uh, and then I really liked what Lee showed with the graphs. So uh, GIS powered charts and graphs. So charts and graphs that showed information that would not have been realized without spatial analytics and GIS on the back side of that. And so that was the deliverable. So I equate that back to what we saw just before the break um, with Art and Linda. So when they came out and showed all the work with Art, uh, Insights for ArcGIS, this just screams out to me uh, all the other projects and things that you're working on right now that we can enable and empower with, uh, with charts and graphs and location. So let's give a big hand out for Marathon. Thank you, Marathon. Thank you.